Hi again. So in the last video we talked about how to measure oxygen consumption and estimate changes in oxidative phosphorylation in isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cells. But as I told you, oxidative phosphorylation happens because of the proton circuit. So sometimes it makes a lot of sense also to measure proton motive force because that's going to be the force that's going to be involved in the synthesis of ATP even though I still maintain that oxygen consumption is generally the easiest and most direct, most precise manner to estimate changes in oxidative phosphorylation. So to measure proton motive force, you have to understand that proton motive force, or delta P, has two components. One of them is delta psi, or the membrane potential, and this is the electrical gradient. It's how less positive the matrix is than the extra matrix space and the intracristy space. So the difference in charges between both sides of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And the second component is delta pH. Delta pH is the pH gradient, or actually how much free protons uh, exist on both sides of these membranes. Now typically in biological media and typically in mitochondria, because they're permeable to an anion such as phosphate, Delta pH is quite low because you have this buffering capacity and you have a permeable anion. So the major component of the proton motive force is actually the inner mitochondrial membrane potential in its electrical characteristic. And that's generally what we measure. We measure the membrane potential and assume that that's most of the components of proton motive force. Although you can measure delta pH, we'll talk about that in the next class. And it could be important, depending on what you're doing, the conditions in which there might be a change in delta pH. So initially, in very early studies, uh, membrane potentials were measured using radioactive markers. But later on, and for many years, they were measured using electrodes sensitive to some kind of cation that could be accumulated in mitochondria in a manner that's dependent on the membrane potential. So cations such as potassium or TPP, that's tetraphenophosphonium, which can go through the membrane and will accumulate in the matrix in a manner proportional to the membrane potential, can be measured. Uh, and they're measured using electrodes. These electrodes can actually be mounted together with electrodes that measure oxygen consumption. And there are a few commercial electrodes available that you can measure membrane potentials in parallel to oxygen consumption measurements inside the same chamber. Um, this is done still today, but also we do a lot of fluorescent probe measurements of membrane potentials, which I'll talk to you about in the next slide. Remembering that when you're measuring the membrane potential, you're going to estimate it based on the Nernst equation and based on the concentration of this cation inside mitochondria and outside mitochondria. You're measuring the concentration of this cation outside of mitochondria. This is the Nernst equation. We can simplify it to 60 under the usual conditions in which you'll study mitochondria in terms of temperature. Um, so you can basically say that the inner mitochondrial membrane potential is going to be 60 times the log of the concentration of this cation inside mitochondria uh, divided by the concentration of this cation outside mitochondria. If you invert inside through outside, you'll just get the same membrane potential, but with a negative or positive charge with the opposite signal. You can also assume mitochondrial intra-mitochondrial uh, potassium concentrations as being approximately 150 millimolar. This is the measured intra-mitochondrial potassium concentration. It doesn't change much if mitochondria take up more or less potassium, because if you take up potassium, you're also taking up water, so you're diluting this potassium and the concentration maintains the same. And also, the intramitochondrial concentration of a cation is going to interfere less in your membrane potential measurement than the outside cation concentration. So if you have a small error here, it's going to interfere less than the change in membrane potential is going to change the outside cation concentration. That's just because of the characteristic of the Nernst equation. So you can safely assume that intramitochondrial potassium concentrations are around 150 millimolar to do these calibrations. 
So how do you really measure delta side today? So most people do not use electrodes, but if you use electrodes, calibrations are the same. Most people use fluorescent indicators or measure absorbance of these indicators also because they're colorful indicators. You can either measure absorbance or fluorescence. Um, very commonly used, we use a lot in the lab, saffron and O. This is a great probe for isolated mitochondrion permeabilized cells. It has very low noise, a lot of signal, and it's very, very cheap. You can buy a pot of that um, from a chemical company. It'll last years for a very low price. Um, there are also some plasma membrane permeable uh, mitochondrial membrane potential probes, such as rhodamine 123 and other rhodamine derivatives, such as TMRM and TMRE. They can all be used also in isolated mitochondria and permeabilized cells, even though they are designed to be permeable to the plasma membrane, so you can use them in intact cells also. We'll talk about intact cells later in the fourth class in this series. So what these indicators have is that when they accumulate in mitochondria, because they have a planar structure, they're going to stack one against each other. And when they're accumulated in high concentrations and stacked in this manner, the fluorescence of the total suspension decreases. So you have a quenching of the fluorescence when the probe is taken up by mitochondria. And you're going to measure less fluorescence in your total media. So here's an example. You have an initial fluorescence of your mitochondria in which there's no membrane potential because there's no substrate. And then you're adding glutamate malate, for example, as substrates. So you're starting to have electron transport and proton pumping. As protons are pumped out and form a membrane potential, safranin, which is the probe that we're using here and we're measuring the fluorescence of, is taken up into mitochondria and there's a fluorescence quenching phenomenon in which you have less fluorescence of safranin. So decreased fluorescence indicates higher membrane potentials. If you add ADP, you have a decrease in membrane potential, so you have an increase in fluorescence. If you add oligomycin, inhibit ATP synthase, you have an increase in membrane potential, decrease in fluorescence. And if you add FCCP, you're going to have a decrease in membrane potential and increase in saffron and fluorescence again. So it's very practical. You can follow this fluorescence over time and follow these changes in inner mitochondrial membrane potentials dynamically over time. Some things to be aware of. First of all, even if you're using low concentrations of these probes and always try to use the lowest concentration possible that you do have a good measurement of fluorescence, you have to remember that they're accumulating within mitochondria. And if they're accumulating within mitochondria, mitochondria are a very small volume of this total media that you have. So the concentration within mitochondria is going to be enormous. And there you can have a lot of toxicity. So many of these probes actually do inhibit mitochondrial respiration, for example, when used in the concentrations that they're used to measure mitochondrial inner membrane potentials. So be careful with that. It might be a good idea to measure respiration in parallel with your membrane potentials just to make sure that your probe is not interfering in your measurements. Um, another thing is that because these probes are membrane permeable, otherwise they wouldn't be good membrane potential probes, but they're also cations, and that's why they're accumulated in mitochondria. They tend to accumulate sort of in the interface between mitochondria, uh, the mitochondrial inner membrane, and the matrix, and they can act as quenchers and blockers of lipid oxidation processes that happen by chain reactions in which one lipid will oxidize another and oxidize another. Sometimes these probes can block these reactions, so they can be inhibitors of lipid oxidation. So you may be measuring membrane potential, and you're not aware of the fact that you're actually using a pretty good quencher of lipid oxidation and inhibiting this process in your media because of your probe, uh, and not because it's not happening. One of my pet peeves about membrane potential measurements, and this is very important, is that a change in fluorescence or a change in absorbance does not correlate one-to-one -one with your inner mitochondrial membrane potential. So what you see here in this graph, and this is very correct, is saffron and fluorescence in arbitrary units. And you see a decrease in saffron and fluorescence in maybe 100 arbitrary units. This does not correlate in any way with a decrease in membrane potential of 100 millivolts. 
Um, in fact, we saw through the Nernst equation that the relationship between the concentration of these probes and the membrane potential is not one-to-one. -one. It's a logarithmic relationship. Additionally, the relationship between fluorescence and the concentration of the probe is not one-to-one -one either. So that means that you cannot get this change in fluorescence and say this is 100% change in fluorescence and say, well, this is then 30% change in membrane potential versus this 100%. You cannot normalize in this manner because the relationship is not one-to-one. -one. Actually, you can have very large changes in membrane potential with very small changes in fluorescence or very small changes in membrane potential with very large changes in fluorescence because you have this logarithmic, um, this logarithmic function for membrane potentials and you also don't have a one-to-one -one relationship between fluorescence and how much probe was accumulated. It's complicated. So please, after doing this course, do not normalize and do not relate to membrane potentials if you didn't calibrate your inner mitochondrial membrane potentials. I think the only honest thing you could do is just show it as fluorescence. So you can say, well, fluorescent changes were this much. And that you cannot go wrong with because that's what you actually measured. But you always have to keep this in mind. Uh, a point here that's really important is that at high membrane potentials, which would be at the low fluorescences here, small changes in fluorescence can be large changes in membrane potential. That's just because of the nature of the Nernst equation. So you may underestimate changes because they're happening in this physiological range here of high membrane potentials because they result in low changes in fluorescence. Um, all of this together really tells you that membrane potential measurements without calibration might not be a good idea because you don't know how much of a change in membrane potential you have just from measuring changes in fluorescence. And the advantage of working with isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cell systems is that calibration of inner membrane potentials is not only possible, it's actually reasonably simple to do. You can transform your fluorescence measurements into membrane potentials in millivolts pretty simply. So how can you do this? Uh, I'm bringing you here to a paper that I published in 2002 because when we published this paper, the reviewer actually asked us to write a more extensive explanation of how we had calibrated inner membrane potentials to help other people when they wanted to do this. So there's actually a long explanation because of this reviewer, and I have to thank this anonymous reviewer because I think it was quite useful. I still refer to this reference today whenever somebody asks me how to calibrate an inner membrane potential. So basically what we're doing here is we're measuring uh, fluorescence of safranin as a, an indicator of membrane potential in permeabilized PC12 cells, and you can see the decrease in fluorescence indicative of the formation of an inner membrane potential uh, in these cells when you put them in suspension and permeabilize these cells. Um, to calibrate these fluorescent changes and transform them in membrane potentials in millivolts, what you're going to do is incubate your cells or your mitochondria in media that has absolutely no potassium. So typically for physiological measurements, you're going to use potassium because that's an intracellular cation. But when you're calibrating, you have to start with a media with zero potassium because you're going to add known quantities of potassium to force the membrane potential into specific membrane potentials. So you incubated these cells in media with absolutely no potassium. We used only sodium salts in this media. And then you add a little bit of valinomycin. You add a little bit of a potassium ionophore so that potassium can be transported freely across the inner mitochondrial membrane and very specifically add low quantities in the nanomolar range of this ionophore because it's quite selective for potassium, but it's not 100% specific. If you add more, you'll actually lose the membrane potential because you have sodium in the medium. Then you're going to add boluses of known quantities of extra mitochondrial potassium. So you're going to add potassium here, add potassium here, and basically you're doing a stepwise addition of increasing concentrations of potassium. After you add these extra mitochondrial potassium boluses, you can calculate the membrane potential for each one of these potassium additions. Basically, you put the potassium you added out 
as the concentration of potassium out, you estimate the intramitochondrial potassium concentration as 150 millimolar, use the NERST equation, and calculate whatever membrane potential you have at each one of these points. You can then plot the fluorescence you have versus the membrane potential you calculated for each one of these potassium additions. And this allows you to create a relationship between fluorescence and membrane potential. So you can fit this relationship between fluorescence and membrane potential. And one thing you're going to notice very clearly is that this is not a linear fit. So there is not a linear correlation between fluorescence and membrane potentials, and this is expected, both because there's a logarithmic relationship between concentrations of potassium and membrane potentials, and also because the fluorescence of these probes does not correlate linearly with the concentration of these probes inside mitochondria, which is really what is going to be determinant in terms of calculating the membrane potential. Uh, the reason why the reviewer asked us to do this here was that for many years people had believed that BCL2, which is an anti-apoptotic protein, increased the membrane potentials in mitochondria. And actually we very consistently saw an increase in the uptake of these membrane potential probes such as saffron and O. However, when we calibrated these membrane potentials, we were completely disappointed because we found out that the calibration curves were quite different, but the membrane potentials with BCL2 or without BCL2 were exactly the same. And it turns out that we found that the calibration curves were different because BCL2 changed the size and the shape of mitochondria. So changes in mitochondrial morphology, which as we saw in the first class happen all the time in all sorts of physiological and pathological situations, can change the way the mitochondria respond to membrane potential probes. And if they change the way they respond to membrane potential probes, you cannot trust uncalibrated measurements of fluorescence of membrane potentials under these conditions. So that's why I'm telling you I really want to stimulate you to always calibrate mitochondrial membrane potential measurements especially if you're using isolated mitochondria or permeabilized cell conditions, because under these conditions you can calibrate these measurements quite easily. Either that or just measure oxygen consumption, because oxygen consumption is going to be quantitative and is not going to be amenable to these changes in size and shape that you have. You're simply measuring how much oxygen is being consumed. So that's how you measure membrane potentials. Um, actually, after this fit, I forgot to tell you, you, you can extrapolate and find what your initial membrane potential was. So uh, you can extrapolate your calibration curves and determine your experiment membrane potential, which is the important part of the story. And that's what I wanted to tell you uh, about how to measure oxidative phosphorylation in isolated systems. This is at the end of class two. We'll go back next week with class three in which we will measure ion transport in mitochondria. So bye.